Can there be black holes that don't spin? Is there any use for the moon Earth Lagrange points? And would I like to live in the future? All this and more in this week's question show. It's time for the question show your questions, my answers. Now, as always, wherever you are across my channel, if a question pops in your brain, just write it down in the chat in one of the comments, and I will gather a bunch of them up and I will answer them here. People ask me like, what's the best place to do it? And they post that as a comment in the YouTube comments. And then I reply to them that 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 was the place and this was their chance. So yeah, just anywhere on any video, like I see them all in numerical order. So just go ahead and post a comment in, in any old video that you like, and I will see it. We do the show live every Monday at 5 p.m. Pacific time. So if you want to have the longer version of the show, it's about double the length, sometimes a little bit longer. And we do live questions. I do overtime, stick around longer. So you might have a lot more fun with that. If you want to have the live experience, we do that every Monday at 5 p.m. Pacific time. All right, let's get into the questions. At disinclined to state 9485, Hey, Fraser, a thought occurs if two black holes by an unimaginable fluke had precisely opposite spins, and then they merge would they cancel out, what would a black hole that doesn't spin be like and look like? Yeah, in theory, right, like all black holes are spinning. And the spin is the angular momentum that's left over from when they were a star and all of the material that falls into the black hole, and it spins it up. And in many cases, it's spinning it up to a significant percentage of the speed of light. And that is just caused by the accumulated material that falls into the black hole, it, it adds to the spin. And so yeah, if you had two black holes that merged with each other, and they had precisely opposite spins, they would cancel out and you would be left with a black hole that isn't spinning. And you know, this is like, from what I understand, when you take your advanced astrophysics degree, you learn about black holes, first, they start things a little easily. And they say, like, let's just imagine that the black hole isn't spinning. And then you learn all these calculations based on a non rotating black hole. And then they go, but really, they're all rotating and life gets a lot more complicated. And the reason life gets a lot more complicated is because the black hole itself well, all mass, but especially black holes, as they are rotating, they are frame dragging, they're pulling space and time around with them as they go. And what happens is that when you've got this accretion disk that forms around a black hole, if a black hole wasn't spinning, then actually matter would be able to fall into the black hole into the event horizon sooner than one that is rotating. And one's rotating, of course, this matter is sort of pulled around, swirled around as it's frame dragging, it gets a lot closer to the black hole. And astronomers can actually calculate how fast the black hole is rotating and how much of a gap there is between the black hole event horizon and the beginning of the accretion disk. And they look for a very specific kind of x ray radiation that's coming from this accretion disk. There's a very specific kind of wavelength of x ray radiation that iron gives off as it's just about to die. And in a black hole that is actually rapidly rotating, the energy level is lower because it's actually gotten closer. So I guess it's kind of like stretched out, spread out the amount of time it's taking for that iron to go into the black hole. And with a fast rotating black hole, one of the things that you get is essentially the event horizon flattens out like a oblate spheroid. And the poles of the event horizon sort of come together and come together the faster this thing is spinning, but you can't actually reveal what's inside the black hole, there's like a limit. And so that's the idea of a naked singularity. So you can't get a naked singularity. But I can think of another situation where you might end up with a black hole that isn't rotating. And that is a pet black hole. That is if you've got some super advanced civilization has a giant Dyson sphere around a black hole, and they are dropping matter into the black black hole to extract the energy. This is called the Penrose process. And it's essentially the one of the most efficient ways that you can gather energy in the universe, the black hole becomes a giant battery and you are dropping material into the black hole. As this material gets broken up, part of it goes in but part of it gets ejected, sort of as it's just about to arrive in the black hole, it actually gets ejected out into space, you capture the energy from that ejected material, and you're harnessing energy from the black hole. But every time you drop material into the black hole, and you harvest some of this 
rotational energy, you are slowing down the black hole just a tiny little bit. And so over vast periods of time, as your civilization consumes an enormous amount of energy coming from the black hole, it will slow down and slow down and slow down. And eventually the black hole will stop spinning, and you will no longer be able to extract any energy from it until you find ways to spin it back up again, you're gonna have to go and find some galaxy to tear apart and feed into your supermassive black hole to spin it back up again, so that you can then extract that rotational energy again. So that's what a black hole if it didn't spin would look like. Now I'm sure you've noticed the codes that appeared over my shoulder as I was answering that first question. These are the ways for you to vote to let us know which of the questions you thought was the best one. And I'll admit I was super surprised this week's so the winner was Nabu Cliff Cottrell asked what would happen if time stopped? I think it was Cliff's daughter asking this fiendish question and I gave my best shot at answering it. And I was impressed. That's the one that everybody liked the best. So congratulations to Cliff and your daughter. That was a great question. And uh, so once again, go ahead and just type in the name of the Star Wars planet that you like the question best. And we'll gather up all of the votes and we'll let you know which one won next week. Derivius 2012. Hey, Fraser, when do you think we'll see the first person born in outer space or Mars assuming it's possible? Surely that would be a pivotal moment in human history. I have no idea when <laughs> we're going to see the first human being born in outer space or on some other world. And to be honest, we have no idea if it's safe. In fact, we have ideas that it's not safe, definitely not in microgravity. We don't know if it's feasible for a fetus to gestate on the moon or whether it's possible for them to be on Mars on the moon, it's one sixth gravity on Mars, it's one third Earth gravity. And of course, in just in space itself, there's effectively no gravity. And we don't know, but there have been some research papers that have looked into what would the potential impact to be? How does gravity play a role in the gestation of a human fetus? And there was a paper that I looked at back from 2005. And they talked about the various health implications that would happen to a fetus in microgravity. And so one of the things that you don't realize is that a fetus inside the womb for the for the first part of the gestation is essentially floating in fluid and really doesn't experience a lot of gravity, well, they experience some gravity on their internal organs. Once they reach a certain point, it's like after about the 26th week or so, the fetus is large enough that they're starting to sort of be pulled inside, they're feeling the gravity as mom walks around. And they're actually starting to build up their muscle strength, their heart strength, and a lot of other parts of the body are reliant on this. And so if a child was gestated in microgravity, they would have weaknesses in their spine, they would have a lack of muscle tone in their legs, they would probably have a harder time with their heartbeat. And so there would be a ton of health implications, especially if this child then tried to come back down to normal gravity. And like, it doesn't sound like it's ethical to put a human being through this, right? Mommy and daddy wanted to live in space. And so you have to use a wheelchair now, if you want to live on Earth, it doesn't seem fair. So there is a long line of experiments that are going to have to be done before we can get to a point where we know what is the actual amount of gravity. There have been some tests done with rats, they're not a great uh, stand in for human beings. Uh, the researcher that I mentioned, they suggested using guinea pigs, which are a better model. But really, we need to do some kind of experiment where various animals are gestated in different levels of gravity from microgravity, essentially zero gravity through lunar gravity through Mars gravity, and in some kind of artificial gravity system like a big centrifuge where these animals are born, they live their lives at different levels of gravity to find out. And then from there, you have to very carefully excruciatingly move forward. I mean, again, human lives are on the line here, the health of human beings. And you know, that when human beings are together, they're not going to think about the consequences of their actions. And so people are going to attempt to procreate in space, they're going to attempt to procreate on Mars, before adequate research has been done. And that is again, 
not a smart move. So I wouldn't be surprised if there were a lot of very severe uh, planning done. Talk about like planned parenthood to the nth degree here with uh, in space. So no idea when this is going to happen. It's inevitable. I'm sure at some point someone will be born in space on Mars, on the moon. But it's going to be uh, a long time before we know that this is a safe thing to do. At things and stuff within me Bray 5938. Because every two body system has Lagrange points, is it possible to make use of the moon's L2 point? Maybe a radio telescope that is blocking unwanted noise from the Earth. Sorry to add another Lagrangian point question to the pile. Are you kidding? We live on Lagrangian points. That is our fuel. That is how I practice my space knowledge is to answer every variation of the Lagrange point question. You should not be apologizing. You should be I should be thanking you for more Lagrange point questions. Now, you asked about the moon Earth L2 Lagrange point. So once again, every two bodies have five Lagrange points as long as they are of vastly different masses. So the sun and the Earth, the Earth and the moon, the sun and Jupiter, there are five Lagrange points. Three of them are lined up. So you've got the Earth and the moon, you've got one Lagrange point on the other side of the Earth from the moon, you've got one Lagrange point in between the Earth and the moon, and you've got one Lagrange point on the far side of the moon. And then you have one Lagrange point that is ahead of the moon's orbit, and you've got one Lagrange point that is behind the moon's orbit. The ones that are orbiting with the moon, those are gravitationally stable, while the three that are lined up, they are gravitationally unstable. All right. So what can you do with these things, right? I mean, they are helpful little points. So we'll just kind of go through the different Lagrange points and talk about them. So the one L4 L5, those were suggested as the locations for the O'Neill cylinder. This is Gerard K. O'Neill had done some work with a bunch of researchers to figure out if we could have giant orbital colonies in space. And they suggested that we house these at the L4 and the L5. And that's why you have the L five society. Uh, and so you would be able to have this giant space station that is gravitationally stable, it's not going to drift out of the point, and it's going to be up at the Lagrange point. It's got a nice view of the Earth, got a nice view of the moon, and it's a good stepping off point to go farther out into the solar system. It's not going to crash into the moon, and yet it's still going to continue to orbit around the Earth. The L2 point, this is the one that's on the far side of the moon. And what this is good for, as you said, it, one thing you could do is you could put a radio telescope on the far side of the moon, the Lagrange point, and it would be blocked by the electromagnetic radiation of the Earth. And so you would have a pristine view of the cosmos. But the Lagrange points aren't stable. And they're not actually points, they're more like blobs because when you think about it, you've got the, the gravity of the Earth, the gravity of the moon, you've got the gravity of the sun, you got the gravity of the planets, things are moving around in this region. And so you wouldn't be perfectly stable on the far side so that the moon is always blocking your view of the Earth. The better way to do that is actually just put your telescope on the moon on the far side, and then you know that it's going to be blocked. But what L2 works well for is as a relay point. So you can put a spacecraft out at the L2 point, and it can relay communications from the far side of the moon. So if you've got that big radio telescope you've put on the far side of the moon, it can relay all its communications up to the L2 point and then back to Earth. And actually, the Chinese did something with this as part of their Chang'e mission, they had this relay spacecraft that was on the far side of the moon, and it was able to transmit information from the Chang'e 4, which was at the moon's south pole, and wasn't visible from the Earth. And so it was transmitting up to this point and then coming back to Earth, which was pretty cool. L1, which is in between the Earth and the moon, it's a great halfway point between the Earth and the moon. It's not actually physically halfway, but it is gravitationally halfway. And so if you want to have a way station, if you want to have a train station to go to the moon, you fly up to the L1 point, and then you transfer over into another spacecraft, and then you fly down to the moon. And so it's a good use for that. There aren't a lot of uses for L3. This is the one that's on the other side of the Earth from the moon. But there's one idea that I really like, and that is you could create a giant 
equilateral triangle. So if you go to the L4 point, the L5 point, and the L3 point, these form a giant triangle that is the size of the orbit of the moon. And you put a radio telescope at each one of these points, you can keep them roughly equivalent to each other to maintain this giant triangle. And you've built a enormous radio interferometer or a gravitational wave observatory or a visible light observatory, that would be tough. And so if you think the event horizon telescope is powerful, imagine an interferometer that is 500,000 kilometers across, that would be really cool. So I'm sure in the coming decades, centuries, we will think of all kinds of uses for the Lagrange points between the Earth and the moon, they will end up being very famous, very popular places to put spacecraft at Matthew Stevens 9579. Is it possible that a captured planet could lurk in the Oort cloud? Also, could we determine this mathematically? It is possible that a planet could be captured in the Oort cloud. It's probable that this kind of thing happens or has happened in the past. The when you've got two giant planetary systems moving past each other, the amount of energy that it takes for something right at the very outer limits of the gravitational well to fall into the gravitational well of another star is, is probably not a lot. And so it's likely that there are objects here in the solar system that were captured from other star systems. But we know with almost certainty that there isn't anything out there. And that's because astronomers have looked. There was a telescope several years ago called NASA's Wide Field Infrared Survey Explorer or WISE. And its job was to search the sky in infrared, looking for brown dwarfs and large planets in the outer solar system as well as other things as well. And it was then retasked after it was finished to look for asteroids here in the solar system. And it was so powerful and so capable that it was able to detect any object that was Jupiter sized out to about 20,000 astronomical units, which is about 0.3 of a light year. And it didn't see any. And it could also find something the size of say Uranus or Neptune out to a distance of about 2000 astronomical units. And it didn't. Now the Oort cloud is gigantic. You know, I mentioned that it could see out to 20,000 astronomical units. The Oort cloud is 50,000 astronomical units, which is more than a light year. Like it's on its way out to Alpha Centauri. That's how big the Oort cloud is. And so there could absolutely be a planet that is the size of Jupiter that is 40,000 astronomical units away from the sun that is orbiting within the Oort cloud and wise wasn't able to see it. But if it's any closer than about 20,000 astronomical units, wise couldn't see it. And so planet nine, you know, this mysterious object that's proposed to be out in the Kuiper belt somewhere that is influencing the orbits of other objects in the Kuiper belt, it has to be a certain size, like it can't be the size of Uranus or Neptune and be within a distance of 2000 astronomical units. It can't be something that is the size of Saturn or Jupiter and be within 20,000 astronomical units it has to be something that is either the size of Uranus and Neptune and farther than 2000 AU or something that is smaller, like maybe the size of Mars and it's only a couple of hundred AU. So the kinds of parameter space that whatever it is that is causing this gravitational interaction in the Kuiper belt, it's sort of constrained by what wise was able to survey. And of course, if something does turn up, then say the James Webb Space Telescope would be the perfect machine to go searching for it. Tesla Ranger, what is your opinion of the dark force hypothesis? I've done this question in the past. And so if you do a search on my channel for dark forest, you will find my answer to that question. And so the answer I'm going to give now is roughly the same as the question answer that I gave before, but I've got some new thinking on the matter. The dark force theory, this was put out in one of the books, part of the three body trilogy by uh, Liu Shishin, which is about that there are lots of intelligent civilizations in the Milky Way, but they keep quiet because they don't want to be murdered by another star system. And so as long as you don't pop your head up, then no one's going to try to take you out. And that theory, I don't really buy it. And that's because there are many ways for us to see 
other civilizations out there across the Milky Way. We can detect now the atmospheres of other planets thanks to James Webb. I mean, can you imagine what kind of telescope we'll have in 100 years from now, 1000 years from now, 10,000 years from now, we will have telescopes capable of examining the atmospheres, looking at the landscapes, the mountains, the forests, the trees, the cities on other planets around us. And so if you really wanted to hide, you'd have to live on a planet that has no life and you would have to hide underground and you have to make every effort to hide your existence to the universe. And I it's just like that just sounds hard, right? So it's not about people transmitting a message out like, oh, we shouldn't communicate that it's that people will be able to passively see that we're here. In fact, life itself, like even if we go, uh Oh, we should keep quiet. Life itself has been broadcasting our existence for hundreds of millions of years. If you measure the composition of the Earth's atmosphere with its mix of oxygen and ozone and carbon dioxide and chlorofluorocarbons and methane and all of these things, an alien civilization will be able to put together that there is advanced life here on Earth. So I don't really buy it. And the update is I've been reading the Revelation Space series by Alistair Reynolds. I read the first book, I really liked it. Now I'm reading the second book, I like it even more. Um, I can just tell that this is just gonna be great. And, and now I understand a lot of pieces have fallen into place. And that is the if you enjoyed Mass Effect, the Mass Effect video game, and you like the idea of the Reapers as a an explanation of the Fermi paradox, Revelation Space has got you covered. In fact, I am pretty sure that Mass Effect was inspired by Revelation Space now that I read it like a lot of the ideas are very, very similar, but they're better done in Revelation Space. And that is a horrifying explanation to the Fermi paradox. And so if you kind of, you know, if the if playing Mass Effect gave you the chills, and you're like, Oh, that seems like a good reason why we're alone in the universe. Revelation space will do the same thing. So uh, just another vote for this one. And I like I apologize on the book club thing, because now I'm just really enjoying these books. And I'm going to have to read all four of them as quickly as I can. And so I won't get into another series until I finish these books. But if you haven't already, Revelation Space, Alistair Reynolds, I don't want to spoil it. But but definitely read these books. If you like my answers to your questions, as well as the other things we do at the universe today, consider joining our Patreon club. This allows us to keep minimum ads for everybody. Like as you can see, there are no ads during the middle of this video. As a patron, you also get an ad free experience on universe today.com for life. Even if you unsubscribe, you get ad free videos, early access to interviews, as well as other perks that are exclusive to our Patreon community. Thanks to everyone who has already subscribed and welcome to our recent newcomers, John Fickle, Niels R, Scott Nixon, Richie Stewart, Jake, Auden Malman, Justin Steiger, Roy Corbin, Ray Latool, and Paul March. Join the club at patreon.com slash universe today. Holly Buckley, mate, can you please delve deep into the habitability of lava tubes on Mars? It seems like the only sensible option. Thanks, man. I love your work. Now I've done a whole video just on lava tubes, both on Mars and the moon. And so you can definitely check those out. And I go into all of the numbers and information. If you have a question, chances are I have a whole episode with the answer. But that said, I think it's time for a refresher because I haven't talked about it a while. And there's a few new interesting ideas to tack on to this. So yeah, the moon sucks. Mars sucks. The surface temperature on Mars, for example, yeah, in the daytime, it might get up to 20 degrees on a nice hot sunny day. But at night, it goes down to minus 100 Celsius. Also, there's no air or like 1% the air pressure of Earth, you've got radiation that is hitting you from space that has no magnetosphere at Mars to protect you. So every part of being outside on Mars is awful. You've got perchlorates in the regolith that is toxic if you breathe it like it just goes it goes on and on and on why Mars sucks. But there are these natural lava tubes on both Mars and the moon, which were formed by lava flowing downhill on Mars and then the top of it crusted over and the lava kept flowing and then the chamber emptied out and you've got this gigantic sort of sandworm tube inside um, 
on Mars that you could go and set up inside. And in some cases, we can see these because the roofs have collapsed, you can see where sand is is falling down into the lava tube. And so you know, that's a place to explore. Once you get inside these lava tubes, now suddenly you're protected from the radiation from space, the temperature is actually very mild, you get this average even temperature It doesn't really matter whether it's day or whether it's night. But it's reasonable. Now you still don't have any air. But in theory, you could have some kind of pressurized habitat, or if you were like really adventurous, you could actually wall off a chunk of it, and then pressurize it and you've got habitat inside. On Mars, the lava tubes are bigger than they can be on Earth. And the ones on the moon are ludicrously big, you can have lava tubes that are a kilometer high. And so just imagine you can have a city inside one of these lava tubes on the moon and same thing on the moon on the moon, you're protected from radiation, you're protected from the temperature extremes, it's the ideal place. And in, like in theory, you could find places on Mars where maybe there's going to be still some sort of briny liquid water that you could examine. So they're great places to explore as well as great places to live. Because of this, there's a lot of interesting research that's going on to try and figure out what are the techniques that you could actually use to be able to go into these lava tubes because they're not easy to get at, right? You've got this, this tiny hole at the top of this landscape, and then maybe the solid surface is going to be hundreds of meters down, you need some way to either fly down or repel down. And then once you're down inside that you're blocked from the light of the sun, so you can't have a solar powered object, it's going to be really tricky. And there are a couple of missions that are being considered right now that would say to fly really close to a lava tube and examine the surroundings, other ideas for actually repelling down. And in fact, there's a group with the European Space Agency, ESA caves, that just does expedition after expedition to lava tubes and other caves here on Earth, testing out the different kinds of technologies that it would take to be able to explore lava tubes on other worlds. So they're like the best places to go on the moon or Mars. And they deal with help you deal with a lot of the problems exploring those worlds, but they do come along with challenges of their own. But I think we will see missions to both of these kinds of places announced eventually. Louis B, could we use a radar type system to identify asteroids instead of the current visual identification that we're using presently? Absolutely. In fact, radar has been used to map the surfaces of asteroids quite effectively. And the greatest tool that's ever been built to do this was the Arecibo Observatory. Any time that an asteroid made a close flyby of Earth, say, within a few times the distance from the Earth to the moon, Arecibo was called on to image the surface of the asteroid. And we think about radar, right, this giant dish had this powerful radar instrument, it would beam a radar pulse out from the dish to hit the asteroid. And then the some of the radar would bounce back off of the asteroid, and then they would be able to analyze it and be able to map out the shape of the asteroid. And there was a paper that came out uh, just a few months ago, we actually did a story on universe today about this where they released this data trove of all of the asteroids that Arecibo helped analyze it was like, well over 100 different asteroids that were imaged. And in some cases, on some of the closest ones, like the surface features are pretty amazing how well it was able to do. And then of course, Arecibo collapsed. And this wonderful tool this with this unique capability to examine asteroids and other objects using radar was gone. But just in the last couple of weeks, they brought online a new radar instrument on the Green Bank Observatory. And this is one of the largest steerable observatories in the world. And now it has its own version. Now it's not as powerful as the one in Arecibo, but because it's very steerable, you can point it at many different targets, and it's going to have its place. And in fact, we saw this really cool radar image that came from the Green Bank Observatory imaging the moon in radar, and it looks like a photograph of the moon, but it's actually mapping the surface features in radar. So radar is a very powerful tool, a great way to image. And of course, the best thing to do is to send a spacecraft with a radar instrument on board to an orbit an asteroid, and then map that asteroid out to 
incredible resolution. So Robert Allen, could a series of starships with built in telescopes that could land for equipment updates, make up for Starlink blocking telescopes on the ground? <laughs> like, could space telescopes make up for telescopes on the ground? Sure. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. If if Elon Musk wanted to launch a space telescope to replace the functionality of every single telescope on Earth, they could pull that off, I guess. But the cost would be prohibitive. And there are a lot of things that are lost from having ground telescopes. Like the nice thing with a ground telescope is that you can breathe when you walk up to it and you check it out that you can pull apart some of the instrumentation, you can replace it, swap in other things, you can do tests. There are a lot of interesting observations that are very well made with ground based telescopes. Space telescopes are better like there's no telescope that is improved by having to go through the Earth's atmosphere. But it's just that space telescopes are so much more complicated, so much more fragile, so much more distant, that they're so much more expensive, that you can get a lot of your observing done with a ground based telescope before you have to go to a space based telescope. And the problem is, is that Starlink and uh, these other mega constellations are going to be causing this just increasing friction. Friction is the way I like to describe this that that before you had pristine skies that any place you wanted to point your telescope at, you were able to see with the best possibility that you could with your telescope. And now, every now and then you're going to have a satellite pass through the object that you're attempting to observe. And then not only that, but you actually have this diffuse sky glow that's coming from all of the satellites that is starting to brighten the sky everywhere on Earth. And so all telescopes are getting measurably worse just by the amount of of satellites that are out there. But there are ways to mitigate this, right? The best thing is to provide telemetry. I just did this great interview uh, with Morbid Ja talking about how with carefully planned orbits, and with really good telemetry information, satellite operators and astronomers can work together almost perfectly, so that the satellites are going places where they're not going to impact the observatories, the observatories are notified when the satellites are going to be flying overhead. And so they just time their observations. So right now, it's just the Wild West people are launching satellites whenever and wherever they want, as long as they get the permission from their government, they send up their satellites, and astronomers are having to deal with this. And boy, wouldn't it be lovely if SpaceX and other billionaires supplied scientists with an unlimited amount of observatories for them to carry out their observations, but they won't come on. So here we are in this world where the world is getting access to high speed communication, which is amazing. And I think one of the most important accomplishments for humanity is that we get all human beings connected via the internet to each other to communicate to learn to bank to do commerce everything. And so that's amazing. And the downside, the price that we are paying right now is a loss of the sky. And it doesn't have to be that way. There could have been ways to come to some kind of agreement, but it's not going to happen right now. Who knows, maybe later on, we'll get regulation, but it, we do like we see this again and again, right? It's the tragedy of the commons. What are the real costs of launching a satellite? They're not just flying your satellite into space. There are externalities that you need to factor in like the retrieval cost, right? If you're going to launch your satellite with a giant booster and the booster is going to fall back to Earth, it's going to hit some random place on Earth and spread uh, various toxic gases, you have to clean that up. You can't just leave that on the ground or in the ocean, you have to clean it up. And so if we consider the externalities of like almost everything that we do, right, the decrease of soil, the the greenhouse gas emissions, the destruction of the ozone layer deforestation, all of these are done because we don't consider we don't price in the externalities. And if we did, then various actions would be cheaper, others would be more expensive, and we would have a system of commerce that would match the true cost of doing things. Oh, Chen Zizou. 
why NASA never shows us the craft traveling in the space. I know it's dark, but closing to planets, for example, it will be possible to see things clearly. I'm not sure what you're wanting. So like, you can go outside right now and with a good app, you can time when the International Space Station is going to fly overhead. And you can walk outside, you can look up and right on time, this gigantic space station flies overhead. It is the brightest object in the sky after the moon and the sun. It's as bright as the planet Venus. And you can set your watch to it when it flies overhead. And with a good pair of binoculars or a small telescope, you can actually see the shape of the International Space Station just with your own eyes like you're looking through binoculars, you're looking at the station and you see it. It's possible. But that's not all you go to a, a website like heavens above. And you can track all the satellites, all of the spacecraft that are out there. You can watch for example, when a dragon spaceship is launched to the International Space Station, and you can see the space station fly overhead. And then you can see the other little dot of the spacecraft that's getting closer and closer and closer. And if you're in the right part on Earth, when the docking happens, you can actually see these dock together, or the Soyuz or whatever. When James Webb Space Telescope was flying out to its L2 Lagrange point, various astronomers around the world were able to actually see it. They were able to see this dot, it's just a dot, right? Like a dot that reflects light because it's very far away. And it's very small compared to larger things. But once you're out in deep space, it's impossible to see them because they're just they're so tiny compared to like space itself and the amount of light that's going to reflect off of the spacecraft is minuscule. But there's been some examples where spacecraft have had selfies. So the Chinese mission to Mars on the orbiter spacecraft, they had a little tiny selfie camera that they released as the spacecraft was in orbit. And so we were able to see the entire spacecraft. And then down on the surface of Mars, the Jurong rover, it placed a selfie camera on the surface of Mars, then it backed away. And it took a picture of itself. Of course, during the Apollo landings, as the spacecraft were taking off from the surface of the moon, they had an automated camera that sat on the moon and tilted up and watched as the Apollo lunar ascent module took off. We got some examples of landings on Mars. So for example, when NASA's Perseverance or Curiosity rover were landing on the surface of Mars, the Mars reconnaissance orbiter was flying directly overhead and is able to watch these spacecraft as they landed on Mars, able to see the parachutes and has been able to see the rovers from space. When the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter went to the moon, it was able to see the Apollo landing sites from orbit of the moon is able to see the footprints of the astronauts walking around. So nobody shows images of spacecraft in flight because you would need to send the cameraman along with the spacecraft to take your video. And that's really tricky. So you just get the images from the spacecraft of what it's seeing. And if you're lucky, like say with the Artemis mission, there was a lot of cameras on board, the spacecraft was able to see the actual capsule in position while it's going around the moon. But it's very rare. Most of the time just the spacecraft is equipped with a camera and it takes pictures of the things that it's seeing, because it's kind of ridiculous to send another camera to take images of a spacecraft just I don't know, to to prove to people that it's there. I don't know why. But but then the Chinese did it. So I guess it's awesome. There you go. JM Melanson, if you could step into a time slowing machine, would you want to fast forward to the future? Yeah, Yes, I want to see the future badly. <laughs> I really want to know what happens. I mean, obviously, on the one hand, we have science fiction, Star Trek, Star Wars. I know it's in the past, also in a galaxy far, far away, but still it's futuristic Stargate, but other just like science fiction ideas. What will the future hold 100 years from now, 1000 years from now, 10,000 years from now? Will humanity still be around like assuming we're still around then? The future has got to be interesting. And I would love to see what happens. And I'm sure we're going to do some really interesting things in my lifetime. But it won't hold a candle to the really, really interesting things that are going to happen in future lifetimes. So yeah, I think if I could go forward in time and see what happens in the future, I would like to. Um, and my wife would too. Like if I know my wife, if we if there was a button we could both press to see the future. Like she's as much of a future nerd as I am. Would my kids like that's all I you know, 
I want to make sure my kids, my kids would probably press the button too. So, so I'd hopefully as a family, we'd be able to move forward into the future. But yeah, I really want to see the future. And that's like, like, that's part of the motivation, I guess. That's why I do what I do. And that's why I sort of where I sit on the space news science content sphere is I like to live right on the bleeding edge. What are the new ideas? What are the stuff that's going to be in the future? What what solutions are being worked out to problems? What new discoveries have just been made? What spacecraft have been announced? I'm always trying to live 5, 10, 15 years into the future. And it's, you know, for the amount of time that I've been doing this, right, closing in on 25 years now, I've been able to go through the entire cycle. Like I remember when New Horizons launched and I was thinking, boy, it'd be so cool that in 10 years from now, we will see pictures of Pluto. And yet I was able to go through the entire process reporting on every on the trials and tribulations of the spacecraft. And finally, it reached Pluto and we saw those pictures and then it reached another object. So I have no regrets, but I would love to see the future. All right, those are all the questions that we had this week. Thank you everyone who joined both live but also asked questions in the YouTube comments. Remember, we do this show live every Monday at 5pm Pacific time. So if you want to have the longer episode experience, come join us live. And don't forget to vote for the question that you thought was the best. We'll see you next week. If you want to stay on top of all the important space news, join my weekly email newsletter. I send it out every Friday to more than 60,000 people. I write every word, there are no ads, and it's absolutely free. Subscribe at universetoday.com slash newsletter. You can also subscribe to the Universe Today podcast. There you can find an audio version of all of our news, interviews, and Q&As, as well as exclusive content. Subscribe at universetoday.com slash podcast, or search for Universe Today on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. A huge thanks to everyone who supports us on Patreon and helps us stay independent. Thanks to all the interplanetary researchers, the interstellar adventurers, and the galaxy wanderers. And a special thanks to Tim Whalen, Dave Varabioff, Josh Schultz, and Andrew Gross who support us at the Master of the Universe level. All your support means the universe to us.